turn my lights back up now. I'm pleased to uh, introduce to you once again and bring to the stage uh, our uh, sheroes, heroes, and survivors. We're very, very pleased to have here now uh, three people uh, who can tell a story. Uh, that's an old story, uh, but not a forgotten story, and it's a painful story, and yet it's a redemptive story because we're still fighting uh, for what they've done and what they represent. Uh, and coming to the stage now, uh, you'll be able to uh, meet uh, the three, three of the representatives. When we started this lawsuit, we had 150 clients in 2003 when we filed the lawsuit. Uh, and we have been fighting with the state uh, and the city uh, of uh, Oklahoma and Tulsa. Uh, and we have lost many battles, but we are resilient. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce that on April 24th, for the first time in the history of this effort from 1921, that Congressman John Conyers, who is the new uh, chair of the House Judiciary Committee, held the first ever hearing on the Tulsa race riots hearing and has introduced legislation to allow these survivors to finally, after nearly 90 years, to get some justice for what happened in the 1921. Please welcome Otis Clark. Wes Young, and Dr. Olivia Hooker. And uh, to join them uh, is my classmate and friend, the videographer who has done the uh, documentary on Tulsa, and we'll see a clip from that uh, uh, shortly, uh, is a uh, graduate of Stanford University and Georgetown Law Center, uh, sports agent, uh, and an expert in many areas. Uh, and now he serves uh, as the documentary, the videographer of this great presentation. Please welcome to the stage uh, Reggie Turner. Let me start, I want to start if I can with uh, Dr. Olivia Hooker. Uh, to tell us a little bit uh, about 1921 and what happened to her and her family on that day, May 31st, 1921, and June 1st, 2000, 1921. Okay. Greetings and thank you, Dr. Ogletree and your wonderful staff for bringing us here today once more to remember all the desecration and defamation that we suffered and to have people come to share with us our sympathies. I was six years old at the time of the 1921 disaster. And because we lived in a section called Greenwood, which has been dubbed Black Wall Street, the children were very protected. And I think of the five children in my family, I was the one that suffered the most from the emotional effect of the riot because I had been a complete idealist. I had learned to read at age four when I would go down to my father's department store and take his lunch, and he taught me to read on his old Olivetti typewriter. So I believed every word in the preamble to the Constitution and in my country tis of thee and all the ideals that our teachers at Dunbar School taught us. And that morning of the riot, first the militia came and took away the men, and they even took my eight-year-old brother, took all the black men away, said they were disarming both sides. However, they disarmed the black side, and we later learned, gave those weapons to the mob, which they had de deputized as sheriffs. Uh, deputy sheriffs, but we didn't know that then. However, we did know that bullets were hitting our house at a great rate, but I didn't know they were bullets. I thought it was hailing and the sun was shining brightly. So I said to my mother, how can it be hailing when the sun is shining brightly? And she said, come with me, and had me peep through the Venetian blind and she said, you see that thing up there with the American flag on top of it? I said, yes. She said, that is a machine gun. Mm. And it's shooting at you. Your country is shooting at you. 
And that's what those noise, blip, blip, blip. It's not hail, it's bullets. This was a great shock to a young child who believed that there was freedom and justice and equal opportunity in this world. And my mother had said, well, we have to eat anyway. So she put us under the big oak table while she cooked breakfast. But when the mob came in, they didn't come, come in the front door because the machine gun was up there. They came in the back door and they saw food on the stove, so they took it out and dumped it on the ground and proceeded to take whatever they thought was valuable, like my mother's pigskin suitcase, but they didn't take my sister's little wicker suitcase. They knew what was worthwhile, and that's what they took. And what they couldn't take, they couldn't take the piano, so they hacked it up with their, with their hatchets and they had those big uh, pine things lighted so they could set fire to my grandmother's bed and my grandmother's uh, sewing machine. And uh, they knew what to break because my mother had Caruso records that she prized greatly. And they broke all the Caruso records, but they didn't break the old rugged cross. So you can see they were trying to give us a message. We were a little bit out of our place in Greenwood, and they were trying to tell us to go back where we had been. And a lot of people did not realize that they had airplanes, and they were dropping incendiaries from the air. Now, the government has pictures of those, and thank goodness Eddie Faye Gates has, has uh, chronicled in her book the, the fact that there were airplanes dropping destruction from the air as well as guns and bullets and hatchets and people who just simply wanted to tear things up so that this was a very frightening experience however the machine gun captain sent down the deputies to say to tell my mother to get out of that house he could not protect her and my mother said she had been trained in oratory at tuskegee and the professors had come from Harvard, of course, Charles Winterwood and the Houstons. So my mother said, I won't leave until I tell these people off who have brought hundreds of children to watch this destruction of a whole black neighborhood. And so my mother stood up on a big rock and she started to preach at them and she told them, well, you may not suffer as a result of what you're doing, but those children onto the third and fourth generation yeah. will feel it. So the children started to cry and the people said, well, make that woman shut up. She is scaring our children. Mm -hmm. Now the children are watching 5,000 homes being burned down, but that didn't scare them. But my mother's talk scared them. Well, there's always something good in life, even though there's a lot of bad hate and evil. And a man came up to my mother and said, I can't go in your house while the mob is still in there, but when they leave, I'll go down and save what I can if you stop your oration. <laughs> so my mother said, okay. And, uh, so we went with what they call, quote, a place of safety in a white church over across town. But the thing that was happening in Tulsa, because it was an organized destruction, the local Red Cross was not doing what should. They were telling people, you could have a cot or a tent if you can come to my house and wash my clothes or cook for my children. In other words, they tried to bargain instead of giving out the materials that Red Cross usually gives to people. They called us refugees, but they made us refugees. So Walter White came and blessed the name of Walter White. They didn't know, of course, that he was one of us, and he circulated around and found out a lot of details, which he later wrote about. Let me just say one word here, Dr. Hooper, before you finish. Walter White was the head of the NAACP, a very white-looking African-American man. Mm -hmm. So he spent a lot of time among whites in Tulsa, 
getting all the information yeah. and then reporting it back. And he's mentioned in all the reports on Tulsa. So he advised the, the black people, don't take anything from a local Red Cross. And then the National Red Cross will look into it. They'll say, well, why aren't they moving the cots and blankets and tents? And they'll come and they'll send somebody decent here to Tulsa, which is just what happened. A man named Maurice Willis was sent from the National, and he became a real hero in Tulsa. And later they learned, they named the Black Hospital, because uh, you know we couldn't go, we weren't welcome in any other hospital, and they named it Maurice Willis Hospital in honor of him and what he did to try to help people whom they call refugees who lived in tents the fall of 1921 because they didn't have any houses left. My family moved the children and mother to Topeka, Kansas, where my sister had been in boarding school. And my father stayed there and tried to re uh, rebuild his business. However, he had all those debts for the things that he had bought on credit to sell to his customers, and he didn't declare bankruptcy, and therefore he tried for seven years. He sued the insurance company, the fire insurance company, but they finally threw it out of court because they didn't intend to pay any black person any reparation money. And at that time, my father went bankrupt, and he, we moved to Columbus, Ohio. But People say, well, how do you remember all that? Well, if you know any Oklahomans, you know they are clannish. They stick together. And every summer, whenever they went to a convention or wherever they went, they couldn't stay in hotels. They would drop by their friends in the North and uh, recount all of their experiences. So the Black Dispatch in Oklahoma City, uh, Dungy's paper, was a leading paper and they always kept up with everything. So people did have memories because the black press helped them to uh, remember and to publicize what was happening to black people because it wasn't put in the major media. There was only one major media, the Literary Digest, that even published an article about that riot. And it was not until a few years ago the state of Oklahoma decided that we were victims and they gave us a medal, no money, but a medal and an apology for the riot. And what Dr. Ogletree is doing and with his fine staff is trying to make the conscience of America wake up and remember that if we treat people that way, some days worse things can happen and worse things are happening. So I'm very grateful to you for being here and to Dr. Ogletree and his staff. And if you have a question, you can ask me. Thank you, Dr. Hope. Next, we'll hear from Wes Young. His wife, Catherine Young, is with us as well. Catherine, would you please stand to be acknowledged? Where's Catherine? Mm -hmm. There she is. Hello. Uh, and, and Mr. Young, if you can tell us a little bit about your experiences. I want you to start backwards. I, I have been saying that Oklahoma gave the Tulsa Race Ride Survivals uh, a gold medal to uh, acknowledge the grief of 1921, and you've corrected me. You want to correct that one more time so I'll get my facts straight and won't say that again? Uh, they gave us a uh, gold painted medal. <laughs> a piece of lead. It was painted with gold paint. That's what they gave us, and uh, my recollection of, of uh, Ray's route is mostly secondhand from my mother and my sister, and 
when uh, we realized it was a, was a riot going on. Well, let me go back. On the 31st of May, well, some young white lady accused a black shoeshine boy of touching her improperly when he was going upstairs on the elevator. And they knew each other. And when she came back down and he was still, he had to go upstairs on the top floor to use the restroom, whatever. Well, she went and told one of the managers that so-and-so rubbed me on my butt when I had, in the, when I had taken him upstairs. So they arrested this young man, put him in the county jail. But during the day, at 12 or 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, rumors got out that the Ku Klux Klan was going to take him out of the jailhouse and lynch him. So in, back in those days, the Ku Klux Klan was big enough to tell you what they was going to do to you, then they would do it. <laughs> so a bunch of young black men said, we're not just going to let him, let them take him, we're going to protect him. So they went up to the jailhouse around five or six o'clock in the evening, and they and they didn't have but one jail on, and that's the county jail. They just had one jail that was taking care of the whole uh, jail. So one of the men went in and asked the jailer to say, do you want us to help you protect this prison? They say, oh, no, ain't nobody going to come by. They say, y'all going back to it, so and so and so and so. Well, it was about between 12 and 20 blacks, and they were armed. See, back in those days, it wasn't easy for a black man to get a firearm. He could get one. And some of the soldiers from World War I kept some of the, their <coughs> weapons. But you couldn't go downtown and buy a weapon. You couldn't go downtown and buy ammunition. So the first surprise that the Ku Klux Klan got was when they came up, when they, they came downtown to get him out of the county jail, where they were confronted by 20 young black men who was armed. And they said it, they told him, said, you're not gonna take this young man and lynch him. Well, in the meantime, they had uh, taken this black man out to a uh, little server about nine miles from Tulsa, Sand Springs, and they hid him there. And while they was up there arguing and arguing, well, it was one shot was fired up there, and they they finally got got the confusion quieted down, and they told the blacks, "So you go back down in your part of town, and you whites go back to your part of town." So. At those few hours, that, that is what happened, we thought. So we went on back home. And uh, back in those days when you would, would have an unusual victory or something, if you had some ammunition and a gun, well, you'd go out and shoot up in the air. And that's what they were doing until somebody, somebody told them, say, don't shoot up all your ammunition, you might need it to protect yourself. 
Well, it quieted down. Everybody went to bed. Around one or two o'clock, you heard somebody come running through the alley, through, through the neighborhood, they said, get up, get out of your house, don't pick up anything. They said, they're gonna burn your house down, and they'll kill you. So we just had to get up and rush out. Now, the dividing line from a South to us and North to us, South to us lived was white, North to us it was black. And it was about uh, three blocks between like 4th Street and then 1st, 3rd and 1st, 2nd Street was the business. And uh, Archer was where the black section started. And that's where this started, right there. And we were living in on that and the 300 block on Frankfurt, which is a block east of Greenwood. And we got to notice before they had did all the bill burning and whatnot. And my mother and my sister went to Booker T. Washington High School. And it was about in the 700 block on, on uh, Elgin. And that's where we were, and it was uh, any, any number of people. Now, before, be, before the thing really got bad, well, uh, the men see y'all go and stay in the, in the public schools. See, they're not gonna bother you, the kids and the women. The men went further out, out like a, a big park. It was uh, named Simon Berry Park. And he was a well-to-do black man. And at that particular time, he owned the airplane. And uh, anyway, he didn't get to do anything with it because when it, when it came up on us, they kind of overpowered us. And the, and the men went north, and we, they told the women and children, see, if you know some some white person will take you in, you go to their house. If not, you go north. And so the, the safest place we, we uh, found was at Booker T. Washington High School, which was about three blocks where I stayed, from where I stayed. And we went there and it was just any, any um, number. Uh, women and children. All the men that went further north to like Mohawk Park and uh, Berry's Park, which was kind of out, out in the country at that particular time. It's all grown up now. And we stayed there overnight. And around 12, 1 o'clock, the National Guard came to Tulsa and they quieted things down, but but Tulsa had burned down by, time, by the time they got there, the color part of town, it burned completely down. On the south side of town, I don't think they even lit a candle, and, but the black part of town was burnt completely down. We didn't go across Arches South. There were no, no black people to cross Arches South on that particular day, unless they were working in the serving quarters. And, and it, I've heard some stories said some of the whites told that the maid and the, the butler and chauffeur said, don't go home tonight. They would stay here, we got something for you. They wouldn't tell them what was gonna happen. But it, it, it had spread it out. 
through the whites. When the fire started and burned the house down, we didn't hear nothing from the fire department. No county sheriff come, and the city police was none of them on the north side. Later on, the mob came, and it was later said that they had opened up the gun shops and the pawn shops where you could go and buy your gun and some ammunition, and they were just passing them out if you were white. They'd give you a gun and say, go out there and kill your nigga. Go kill your nigga. Well, that, that all happened in, in, in my area in less time, in about five, five hours, because daylight, you could look out and see where you used to live, where all the colored people used to live, was burned down. Just burned down to the ground. And the, the National Guard from Oklahoma City came in on, on uh, Midland Valley Railroad, and they stopped right in the middle of all this destruction and thing, and they unloaded. And if they would see a, white, a colored man, they would arrest him. Now, why are you going to arrest a man? Because his house is burned down. That's what we can understand. But they, they would arrest a colored man. But all the whites had guns and everything and roaming and burning and killing and doing what they could. And, and it, when it cleared all up, they said the black man didn't have no business trying to save a colored man's life, which they know it was just a, just a, a story. See, because back in those days, a black man, a black young man, say 14 years and up, he could look across the street and see a white lady. And if she didn't like the way he looked at her, she could have him lynched. She could tell a story that he did something, and they believed it. It wasn't, you, don't, you didn't dispute a white man's word back in them days. So if he said you did something, you just close your mouth, turn around, and walk on away from him. Because if you call him a lie, it could cost you your life. If you call a white man a lie in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it could cost you your life. Well, after the riot, All the colored people had lost their homes and all of them had stayed there. Quite a few of them left. But in after, right after the route, early that morning, you couldn't leave to us. It got daylight. You couldn't leave to us. They had they had a train couldn't come in to us. And there wasn't no train leaving. Only way you could leave, you would be running and looking back. Or you had a car or a wagon, and mostly wagons. But the city stopped the American Red Cross from giving us any kind of aid. Now the, the only kind of aid they, they were giving us was uh, they they had uh, commanded the the the. <coughs> So it's a state fairground, and they had a big uh, building there, and that's where I guess the two or three thousand blacks, and they gave them tents and blankets and food, and they gave us a shot. They gave us, I think it's typhoid shot, and the vaccination from the measles, and. Uh, 
Latin was it was all over, and and the colored people was claiming the land and whatnot, but they didn't have no uh, valid claim to it. Now the only way most of the people got the land back. Like back in them days, when you take out an insurance policy, they would take a picture of your house right on that block, right where the, where the house was, each block. See? And it, it didn't have to be no uh, 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 mortgage insurance, but if you take out just sick, you know, if you take out a health policy, they had all the houses and where that policy was. And that's the way most of the people got the land back from that because there was no other way for them to get it. it and next, uh, I think they, two weeks we stayed out on the fairground. And then they came, the city came, and build some tents and gave people some army cots. And that's where they stayed until they could get back on their feet. Now, in, in 1921, the people must have had some money because they built back downtown in 1922. See, well, the city had passed the ordinance that you can't build downtown unless you build something fireproof, like stone, brick, uh, uh. So they couldn't build back downtown like it was just plain wood and shingles and stuff. They had to have a a fireproof foundation in our structure. So well, they didn't know they they made that ordinance because they didn't think the black people had any money. But they had money. They didn't have it in the bank. Because if they had, had it in the banks, they would have been able to get it. Not in the Tulsa Bank. I don't know where they had it, but they had money to build back in less time in a year. It's, it's some uh, building there. If you go down on Greenwood, you'll see a couple of them got the, the cornerstone up high, 1922. It's, it's several of them at 1922. And the people build back just that fast. And they, they didn't know whether, today they don't know where the money came from. There wasn't nowhere for them to guard. And they had burned the houses up so they couldn't heat it in the houses. But some kind of way they, they got money to build back up. And the bad part about it, right in the middle of the black part of town, it was a brickyard. But they couldn't go there and buy any bricks to build a house in Tulsa. They wouldn't sell it. They'd have to drive 15 miles, a little, little town, Ames of Papa. They would have to hitch up their wagons or whatever and go over there to build the downtown. But the rest of the town, you could, you could put up 10 or whatever you want to. And, and and it's a it's a secret today of where that money came from <laughs> because it, 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 I mean if you go and look you can it will uh, well, I mean it would blow your mind as you go there and look and see now how could they put this building up here see there was no uh, Brick buildings or nothing. All the buildings, the hotels, see now, 
during the race ride and right after the race ride in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was one time, in like in 1940, 1939, 1940, they had the latest drug stores, barber shops, and Dr. Hooker's mother had a variety store. I don't, I don't know if you know what a variety store was. You could go in there and you could get different things, like had some for the kitchen, some for the front room, some you could make clothes, and, and uh, thread and stuff like that. And, and they build back, but they couldn't build in the, in the Greenwood section, because they had said, this is a business section. You cannot build with wood and whatever you have to build, something with fireproof. And they build it back in one year's time. Better than and it's some, of, some of the buildings standing now. It's been torn down. Some of the, some of the buildings, but right now some of the buildings are standing and it's steady. Thank you very much, Mr. Westbrook. from the, uh, again, the senior member of the Tulsa Race Ride Survivors, Odin Clark, who was 18 years old. Uh, and this community, uh, Greenwood Archer and Pine Streets, uh, you may not know much about that, but how many of you have heard of the Gap Band? Yeah. Okay, it's not about the racial gap, it's not about the income gap, it's not about the gap genes. The Gap Band is from Tulsa, and, it's, and their name is Greenwood Archer and Pine. That's where the Gap Band comes from. You've had your moment of history today. But the other part of it, you remember, the, you remember those songs? Remember that song, You Dropped the Bomb on Me? That was not about Swain. That was about Tulsa in 1921. So even these young brothers who were trying to be the 70s grooving group had a sense of history. And even though all of us in the 70s uh, and now uh, swerve and to the Gap Band, we have no idea that they were telling another story about these survivors that have long been lost. One other fact for you here from uh, uh, Otis Clark is that how many people have read or heard John Hope Franklin, the great uh, historian? What most people don't know is that John Hope Franklin grew up in Rentonsville, Oklahoma, which is very close to uh, Greenwood. And on the day of the ride, on May 31st, he, his sister, and his mother were sitting on the railroad track waiting for his father, Buck Colbert Franklin, a lawyer, to come pick them up because he'd set up a law practice in Greenwood. And he was coming to pick them up that day to bring his family to move from Rentonsville to Tulsa. He never showed up. And John Hope Franklin writes about this in his book that he, as a six-year-old, was disappointed. He thought his father had abandoned him. He didn't call. He had no idea what was going on. Months later, they saw a copy of the Muskogee, Oklahoma newspaper saying there had been a race riot and many deaths, but no names. He had no idea what had happened to his father. A year later, they got a letter from their father saying, I'm all right. I'm alive. My law office is burnt down. Our home is burnt down. I was held in a camp. Uh, I, I can't be with you, but as soon as I get back on my feet, I will come and get you. Buck Colbert Franklin, a lawyer from the early 1900s, uh, filed a lawsuit on behalf of all the survivors who lost their homes. And the courts dismissed every one of those lawsuits uh, right after they were filed. It took him four years from 1921 to 1925 to go from Tulsa get reestablished and bring his family back uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so John Hope Franklin is one of our clients as well. He's a survivor. And let me tell one little story about John Hope Franklin, which characterizes John Hope Franklin. As we were looking for plaintiffs to file those lawsuits in 2003, they called all the survivors and, and get information. Where'd you grow up? Where was your house? What's your background? And everybody gave basic information. And one of these students at the University of Tulsa, a law student, came to me that night. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning, Professor Ogletree. We called one guy, and he just seemed really weird. He, we couldn't understand him. So what do you mean? Well, his name was John Franklin or Hope Franklin or John something. And we, we, I tried to get some information. Uh, had he ever written anything? And most survivors said no. He says, I've got, he says he's got 18 books. 
right? And what, said, yeah, he's written a book called From Slavery to Freedom that's in its ninth printing. Uh, he says he's from Harvard and he's taught at Chicago. He's just all these crazy stories, right? So this law student had no idea who he was talking to. And so I finally called John Hope and said, John, uh, do you want to be part of this lawsuit? He says, no, that's the past. I want to leave it alone. I said, that's perfectly understandable. I, I, I know how you feel, uh, and I know you want to put it behind you. I'm just trying to do what your father, Buck Colbert Franklin, tried to do 80 years ago to represent the people who never got their justice. He said, oh, you're trying to talk me into this lawsuit? I said, no, said, no I'm not talking anything. He said, he said well, uh, let me tell you what happened. He explained the whole story. I said, are you in? He said, in my end, sign me up right now, right? And that's how John Hope Franklin became one of the descendants of uh, one of the uh, Tulsa race riot victims. Uh, and as much as he said, I'm not a reparations man, he said, you know, what happened to my family is inexcusable. We've never gotten a dime for our home, for our office, for our misery. And it's not that he's looking for money, he's looking for justice, like all these uh, plaintiffs are, and that's what it's about. But John, John Hope Franklin's story is an important one because despite what happened in Tulsa, he's going on and he, he testified on April 4th before Congress that made a big impact. Uh, in fact, there were supposed to be three witnesses from the, from the Democrats and three for uh, the Republicans, uh, me, uh, Dr. Hooker, and John Hope Franklin. Uh, and when they heard that John Hope Franklin was a witness, none of the other people wanted to testify. I said, well, we, we, you know, let's leave that alone. We hope he won't say much. And he had a, a history lesson for the entire Congress on April 24th that had a big impact on, on, the, uh, uh, on the impact. Uh, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Otis Clark, uh, who was, uh, was 18 at the time, uh, and has told this story uh, and has told it over and over again. And it's even hard for him to even remember all the details because 104. Uh, but, but the passion of his voice, he remembers what it was like back then, and then you'll get a chance to see him. We've been videotaping him since we started this film uh, three years ago, and you'll see uh, in the video that will follow this uh, the context for John, uh, for Otis Clark, and all the others. So Dr. Clark, Otis Clark, the mic's yours. Tell us about Tulsa in 1921. I uh, thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I, uh, Start to think and make you to know that Tulsa, Oklahoma at the time was the oil capital of the world. And we had oil wells surrounding Tulsa. And uh, at that particular time, Tulsa was also blessed to have quite a few men that was of business, the Williams Theater, and we had what you might say is uh, pool halls and theaters and different recreation spots in the city, which was on Greenwood. Now Greenwood was one of our main little city, uh, streets that went across the city on the colored side. We had two sides of, uh, of Tulsa. Uh, we had the white side was on First Street on the, um, that would be on the uh, south side of the Frisco train tracks that crossed the city at that time, uh, going from Kansas City to Oklahoma City, was the Frisco and Sandy Fee Railroad. And um, on the north side of the Frisco tracks was the colored sex section. And on the colored section, we had our theaters, and we had uh, Williams Theaters, uh, Williams, uh, uh, let me see, uh, we had some uh, spots there, let me see. We had pool, pool halls, and we had uh, uh, skating ranches and whatnot all on Greenwood. But Greenwood was the colored side. And on the south side was the white side. That would be on, that would be on First Street on the 
south side of the Frisco tracks and on the north side of the Frisco track was Greenwood, which was on the colored side. And we had, at that particular time, we were kind of blessed with what you might say is all of all fields. And around Tulsa, we had what you might say is all wells. Some of my folks also had what you might say is all money. <laughs> <laughs> you might say. <laughs> time we didn't know too much about it, so we bought them big automobiles. Because <laughs> <laughs> some of them big automobiles had 20, had around 26 cylinders in them. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh -huh. And we running up down old gravel roads because they had, didn't have pavement at that time. So we didn't run down the dusty roads. And, but anyway, we was living pretty high then. And one of the main drinks we had back then, then was coin liquor. <laughs> Got good coin liquor. We didn't have all these different other brands. We <laughs> <laughs> got late days. We just had coin liquor. <laughs> but after all, we had our fun with our coin liquor. <laughs> but at that particular time, uh, Jackson's funeral home. Uh, he was a young man that started. Uh, uh, what you might say is operating in with a fuel business and um, uh, I was oh he would he could tell the truth about it he was the father of my sister's two children <laughs> 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 was mad. Some way we had more than they had downtown. And so we was getting along nicely. But uh, on the morning of the 21st, uh, when the riot started, the, the thing that started this little riot, as you heard them already discussed, was uh, we, some of, us, some of our particular people was. Uh, able to, what you might say, have money enough to do whatever they wanted to do. And we was getting along pretty nice down on Greenwood. And Greenwood was our main little business city for the color. On the, that would be on the north side of the Frisco tracks. Uh, and we had probably everything that they had downtown, as I said, and then had more. And we was getting along nicely. But something happened, the jealousy uh, arose. Uh, and some of the whites from, from Arkansas and diff different spots in, uh, in the South was jealous of the colored having what we had, because we was getting a living pretty high, because we had all, well, we had all well money. And um, we were living pretty nicely and getting almost everything we wanted. And sometimes we had more than they had downtown. And so we were just blessed like that. But when the, uh, the whites to come in from the south saw us living so well, see, we, were, we started out, it was Indian territory. 
That was before it was in Oklahoma. See, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Before it was a Tulsa, before it was an Oklahoma, uh, it was Indian Territory. And we, we were blessed with oil money. And we had several, what you might say, millionaire men there that was handling oil. And we were blessed to get some of this oil money. And we was getting living pretty high. And different ones that come up from the South Whites and Arkansas and different places close to by and saw us living so well and they were jealous of that. And, they, and because of that, uh, that, that started the ride business. Mr. Clark, let me ask you about after the ride. You left and went to California looking for your father. That's right. But who did you work for when you were in California in the early oh. 1920s and 30s? And beyond there? Joan Crawford. Movie spot. <laughs> Who else? And I, I served Clark Gable, mm -hmm. Charlie Chapman, and Stephen Fetch. It was my, he picked me to buddy with him when he had his special Cadillac. <laughs> and, he had his uh, and so I got with the movie folks. Right. And with the movie folks, I got a chance to live pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> And so, um, I'd come back every now and then and visit my mother and my sister who stayed in Tulsa. And they had a home out on, Green, on Greenwood. And, um, and, and they, they stayed in Tulsa. And, but I, what you might say, went to California. And in California, I was blessed to get with the movie folks. And with the movie folks, they live high. <laughs> Please thank uh, Mr. Otis Clark for his contribution. Thank you. We have a trailer, it's not the video, but a trailer from the documentary from Tulsa that we're going to gear up now. And Reggie Turner, who is uh, a set of classmates of mine from Stanford, a graduate of Georgetown Law Center, and a very prominent uh, sports agent, an entertainment agent, uh, got into this case three years ago, and he'll briefly describe what he's doing. Uh, and you'll get a chance to see uh, an earlier version, this is not even the current version, for the interest of time, we're showing a, a, a trailer, uh, and then we'll uh, be hearing from the panel uh, of our uh, legend. Reggie? Thank you, Charles. Is this on? Okay. Yeah. I didn't get into this, I was forced into this. <laughs> by him, <laughs> my, my brother from another mother, as, we, as we're fond of saying. Uh, Charles, when he, he explained to you earlier about how he stumbled, literally stumbled upon this case. And because we talk as frequently as we do, I was living vicariously with him through all of the pretrial motions and actions on the case. And he filed a motion there was a motion to dismiss that had been filed on the case. And he filed a motion requesting an evidentiary hearing and testimony. Those of you with a legal background recognize the, the unlikelihood that the court would entertain the motion. And so we didn't have high hopes. But as Charles is uh, often capable of doing, turning the impossible into the possible, the motion was granted. And he sent me an instant message online uh, letting me know that it had happened. And I said, you know, that's tremendous, brother. Kudos to you. At the same time, he was out promoting his book on Brown versus the Board of Education. And I said to Charles, it would be wonderful if we'd had footage from those days when those attorneys were working on the Brown case. And Charles, you must document this work that you're doing now. It's very important. It's going to be historical, and you must have it. And he sent back an instant message which said, go for it. <laughs> and as boys are apt to do, I said, no, no, Charles, I'm just telling you this is what you, you, you need to do. And he said, no, Mr. Entertainment Lawyer, who won't get involved with me in this constitutional case, go for it. So I said, well, you know, I talked to some people. He said, no, go for it. 
This fell into my lap, not only because Charles pushed it into my lap, and I refused to back down, but this has been divine intervention in my life. As I'm sure each of you have been touched by the words and being in the presence of these people today, they have altered the course of my life, uh, personally, first and foremost, and professionally as well. Uh, it has been a passion and a responsibility that I feel to right this wrong. This story is both a horrific story and its impact. It is horrific in the efforts that the city of Tulsa, the state of Oklahoma, went to the lengths that they did to bury this story. Some of that you will see in this piece. Uh, you'll see complete documentation in the full film. But it's a story that must be told not only because of its importance historically in that time, but because it is the rare and perhaps only opportunity that we as Americans have to alter our history while the victims are still alive. There are no other living survivors of any race riots in this country. This was not the only race riot. This one in 1921 was preceded by several in the red summer of 1919. Most of you are familiar with the Rosewood Brace Riot of 1923 that took place in the feature film that was made about it. But there are no other survivors alive. These people sitting before you and sharing their history with you provide you with a absolute unique glimpse back into life during that time what they survived, and the true beauty is that these, my friends, are true warriors for justice. In their advanced age, they have traveled with Charles and I throughout the country, speaking to audiences like yourself and beyond, speaking to Congress on multiple occasions, although yet they've been denied one day in the courtroom. Their story is being told, we're not going to let it be buried. And we insist that there be compensation and reparations made to these people, these living, surviving victims, before they die. <laughs> 